I have sort of two general points I want to make and then uh, an analysis of what I think happened and why it happened and what it might lead to. And the general points of the first, the first of the, of the general points is that in order to understand, there was more electronic ink spilled over the, uh, the killing of Qasem Soleimani than I have probably ever seen in my life. I mean, there are just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of splashed opinion pieces out. They started within moments, I think, after the, after the news broke, but it, it, hasn't even, it ha hasn't even stopped since. And you can, there are two things to note from the, the amazing outpouring of commentary on this. Uh, it says something about the media environment that we're in, that uh, the, the dominance of electronic media and the importance of social media has turned the business model of all media, including print media, into clickbait, um, uh, first to the post, sort of advertising quality kinds of, kinds of stuff. So there's a lot of pandemonic writing about this and a lot of leaping to, to what I call leaping to confusions uh, rather than leaping to conclusions. So you have, uh, and not just Americans, but I'm talking about just about everybody and in several languages, not that I can read as many languages as Ahmed, but in several languages, uh, people absolutely certain what this means, even before the blood is dried. So you have some people saying, oh, this is the best thing since sliced bread, and other people saying this is going to cause World War III, and so forth. And you know, anybody who is trained properly in this kind of domain knows that uh, that kind of pandemonic language really turns out to be very useful. Um, all of us are prone to it. I mean, all of us uh, are capable of, of uh, getting emotional over some event like this and, and being certain of you know, how it's going to all going to turn out. I mean, I'm probably guilty of it myself when I'm a little bit into my cups. I could probably win an Academy Award for, for Jer Jeremiah's if I really set my mind to it. But this is not the way one analyzes <laughs> this kind of an event. Now, in addition to the volume and the pandemonic quality of a lot of the language, this also was also some good analytical language. But in addition to the pandemonic quality of the language, this dropped into American politics right now in the middle of a very tumultuous, uh, highly polarized, and of course highly partisan political year, the beginning of an election year, in the midst of, a, of an impeachment drama that is being drawn out for one reason and another. And so as I, I asked about Mento, you know what a Mento is? A Mento is a little candy, right? And probably some of you, I hope, have, have been uh, uh, exposed to a science experiment, a kid science experiment. You take, Take a couple of Mentos, right? Take a soda bottle, you know, a Coke bottle, all right? Take off the top, put a dowel through the, 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 the cap of the soda bottle, and put a little plastic rocket on top of it, right? Shove about three or four Mentos into the soda bottle, put the cap on really fast, and then watch the Mento uh, interact with the carbon, with the CO2 in the, uh, in the soda bottle. Take off your hand, and that rocket will go about 80 feet in the air. I mean, it's all, and then you get a big mess because it froths over and turns into a huge mess. So if you've never experienced that science experiment, too bad. But that's what happened. That's what's going on right now. So the Suleimani, the Suleimani uh, 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 killing is the Mento, and and American domestic politics is the soda bottle. You drop it in, go like that, kaboom, and you make a mess. And that's exactly what is happening. So if you need a little thumbnail understanding of what this all, you know, what why the why the media and why the writing on this looks the way it looks, that's the reason. Th those are the reasons. Now, um, and by the way. Uh, uh, from time to time, I'll mention things that I've read that I find uh, especially exemplary or illustrative or useful. So on this point, the most recent David Brooks's comment that I think is a good example of uh, an, a, a pretty sound analysis of this uh, this political phenomenon that we've seen with the language over the Suleimani over the Suleimani business. The other the other general comment that I want to make is much much different, and this will lead me into my analysis of the of the situation. You know. One of the things that happens when a thing like this occurs, right, uh, the first kinds of analyses or observations tend to be worm's eye level, ground level, all right? And obviously there's been a pushing and shoving match between the United States and Iran and other assorted um, lesser um, parties for many years. I mean, it's not like this is the beginning of anything, and it certainly isn't the end of anything. Uh, I'm not, I don't even want to call Churchill the end of the beginning, the beginning. We don't know what this is, but this is just part of a long, nasty tapestry that's been going on for decades. It's, it's, a, it's an important point in that, in that weaving, but it's not the beginning of anything, and it isn't, isn't likely to be the end of anything. But the, the initial sort of 
reactions that people have is, well, to just give you an example, um, a lot of people argue, and I would agree with this, that uh, doing something to push back against the Iranians was necessary to restore American deterrence and protect American forces and contractors that are working in Iraq and that are working in the region. I mean, the, the White House has to have the back of the U.S. military. So if people, are, if, if, if people are in harm's way, they expect the political echelon to do what is necessary to protect them. And Trump had let the deal go down in terms of deterrence. When the Iranians started messing, the Quds Brigade started messing with uh, tanker traffic in the Strait of Hormuz, not only did the president do nothing, but he said, hey, they didn't, you know, not our business. Somebody else ought to, you know, ought to, ought to uh, protect shipping in the Gulf because we don't need the oil anymore. I mean, a truly Randian, you know, zero-sum kind of uh, mentality statement, which is all that this president is really capable of. Uh, and then, and then uh, you know, when the uh, attack on the Saudi facilities occurred, same thing, right? The president didn't do anything, all right? So, well, we weren't attacked, right? We might, we might protect the Saudis if they'll pay us. That kind of, that kind of mercantilistic kind of mentality. And of course, the Saudis had a laundry problem and started sending people to Tehran to talk and ideas and so on. So Trump did nothing. He let the deal go down. And eventually, the Iranians got bold enough to kill somebody as a contractor. I don't even know if the contractor was a US national or an Iraqi national. Uh, Ahmed probably knows. But that's not the point. The point is, you work for the US government, you get killed, you expect your government to have your back. So I can just imagine the scene, right? I can imagine the scene being very similar to the scene in the argument over Ukraine back in early July when the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and the then National Security Advisor, John Bolton, go into the President and say, you can't hold out the aid over Ukraine. I mean, the whole government, not to mention the Congress, you know, the whole executive branch, and thinks this is a really terrible idea. So what did Trump do? It just sent him out of the room and did it anyway for political reasons. I think we all know. Same thing here. I'll bet people walked in the room and said, sir, you've got to do something. You've got to react. Or the next time the Iranians inch a little bit further, show a little bit more ankle, they're going to kill a lot of guys, right? Got to do something. And then they put these options before him on the table, and lo and behold, he picks the one that, you know, in my view, was probably not the wisest one. Now, I, um, on the table, uh, I think there it is. Uh, this is a good time to send, send those around, right? This, this, I think I, quotations from interviews here. And the first one is from Michelle Flournoy. I'm sorry I don't identify her very well in the printout from Michelle, who will be here, by the way, next month, I understand. Uh, and uh, uh, she is discussing the process in this, uh, in this interview excerpt. And I, I commend it to you, because from my experience in government, she's, she's got her finger right exactly on, on the button of what likely happened. The second set of comment, the second comment is from General Petraeus. Uh, it's a very different take. So I wanted you to see the contrast between these two very, very experienced uh, uh, American policymakers and their, their, their take on this. But anyway, uh, this is a worm's eye view, you know, this, this kind of subject, restoring deterrence, how do you restore deterrence, why do you need to restore deterrence, is this the right tactic to use to, to restore, and so on and so forth, right? But this is the wrong, this is only one level of analysis. And this is my second general comment. You could be absolutely correct about all of the ground level analysis about whether this was the right tactic, whether the timing is, was, and so on and so forth, and still not be talking about anything very serious. I mean, in a way, uh, analyzing what is going on with respect to U.S. policy toward Iraq and Iran and, the, and Syria and the area in general is like a series of, uh, you, you can either describe it to like a metaphor, you know, as the, you know, turtles beneath turtles beneath turtles beneath turtles all the way down kind of problem, or a series of ascending concentric circles where each circle spits the next question out at, at, the, at the height of its, of, its, of, its, of its reach. So, okay, so we restore zenith, with, we restore um, uh, um, uh, deterrence with the Iranians. Why? What's, what's the point of that? Well, is the point of that just to get them to stop, you know, taking shots at, at, uh, at Americans? Is the point just to um, uh, uh, try to deter an escalation into a major regional war? Well, yeah, but I mean, is there anything else? Is that all there is? What are we doing there? Why are there American troops in Iraq? Why were there, and might there still be a few American troops? Since why, why are we there? In other words, uh, what's the connectivity between uh, this policy, uh, whatever you think it is, and it's not easy to define because it changes every 48 hours with this president, but what do you, what's the connectivity between what the United States is doing in the Levant right now in Southwest Asia to American grand strategy? How does this fit into the bigger picture? Well, the problem, folks, is that there is no bigger picture that I can, that I can identify. The old grand strategy is dead. It died of success. Uh, uh, there has been no uh, replacement that, anybody, that everybody particularly agrees on in the past decade or so. And this administration has what Lionel Trilling once called many, many years ago, irritable 
mental gestures masquerading as ideas. All right? It doesn't have policies, theories, and certainly not a strategy the way that typical American administrations, most, I won't say all, but typical American administrations, post-war administrations, even, even older, have had. So it's impossible to see how the tactics are embedded in a grander strategy because I can't find one. All right? So this is a problem. Uh, when you're, you're going to talk seriously about this, for example, there, there are many offshoots of uh, the analysis of the killing of Soleimani proper. You see what happened in Iraq afterwards. The Iraqi parliament you know, making body motions to, uh, to evict American, American troops, so on. So and there may, the, the opportunities that this sort of thing might, might provide uh, Russian diplomacy, and is that a good thing or a bad thing or, what, or both, uh, what it means for China. There's so many, many uh, directions that this event spills out and points to, right? But if you don't, if you're not able to, I mean, <coughs> analyzing from an American point of view, and both Ahmed and I are, are U.S. nationals, so when I say we are, are us, I mean Americans, right? Just you know, unless you can embed this in some kind of a strategy, it's very difficult to make much sense out of it, all right? And that, to me, is the ultimate problem here. Now, let me go right into my, my brief analysis, if I may. It seems to me that there are only four imaginable motives that you can ascribe to this act of... Uh, of killing Qasem Soleimani. Uh, and, and here, and these are not mutually exclusive, probably, although they may be, but, but he, here they are, the only four possibilities I can think of. So the first I've already mentioned. This is about, this is about restoring deterrence. So somebody, somebody comes in, guys come into the president, say to the president, you've got to do something, you know? You let the deal go down, you've got to do something. And uh, so this is what he does. So it's impetuous. It's the first move of a, of a chess game without any other moves in mind. No strategy. No, no, nothing. It's just, it's impetuous. He's not thinking about this. He's thinking about impeachment. He's thinking about politics. He's thinking about who knows what he's thinking about, right? The next phase of a trade deal with China, who knows, right? But he's not thinking about this because he doesn't know how, right? And so it's just the first, it's pushing a pawn without any idea what, what's going to happen to the rook, the knight, the bishop, wait, uh, queen, just pushing a pawn. Is that possible with this president? You're damn right it's possible. In fact, it's probable in my opinion. That's, that's motive number one. So, okay, so, so like, I said, like I've said many times, sometimes governments or leaders do the right thing for wrong reasons, sometimes they do the wrong, the, the wrong thing for right reasons, and sometimes they do things for no reason at all, especially in this administration, no apparent reason at all. But, but I think this does restore deterrence to, um, to some extent. I think it also, by the way, sends lateral messages. So you remember Kim Jong-un, rocket man, North Korea, was making threats about, oh, New Year's president, New West. Is he still thinking the same thing? I mean, what the president has done not knowingly, I'm sure, is he's imitating Richard Nixon's brinkmanship. And there are times and places where that's not, not a bad idea. You want to keep the other guy back on their heels, not knowing what you're going to do. It might be a little crazy. In this case, that's eminently believable. So <laughs> it's, not, it's not an entirely bad thing to do that. But did he do it on purpose? Did he do it forethoughtfully? I don't know, but I'm skeptical. Second possible motive, wag the dog. Okay, this is politics. Uh, he's got a, uh, a lot of reasons to want to deflect attention off of domestic politics and wrap himself in a flag. Now, he wants to wrap himself in a flag of military action, but he doesn't want to start a big war because that's not useful for getting reelected, right? So a little bit of violence, a little bit of, of, uh, of blood spilling. Okay, but he wraps himself in the flag, he rallies the Republicans, he shuts up the dissenters in the party. That's useful politically. All right, is, is it possible that this president, from all we know about him, would, would think about a wag the dog sort of thing? Are you kidding? Do beers crap in the woods? Of course that was on his mind. Can't imagine that it wasn't, all right? But now let's be serious. Now let's get to the question of the link between this activity, this action, this tactic, and anything resembling a longer term political, political military strategy. A third possibility is that this is the first step in a regime change war. And that what the president's really aiming to do in his, in his very big brain mind is he's trying to create an escalation dynamic that the United States ultimately will win because we're a thousand times stronger than the Iranians and, and get rid of these people. Now, it's well known that earlier on in the administration, there was some body language in the administration, especially when John Bolton was around, my old buddy John Bolton, that uh, where you could imagine that regime change could be something these guys would think about. All right? President, many months ago, stepped back from it, explicitly said, no, no, we're not interested in regime change. But again, the man's not, not inherently credible, so you don't, know, you don't know why he says what he says. You can't believe anything that he says anyway. If you don't like the policy, wait 24 hours, it might change. You know. So, uh, but it could be. It could be uh, the beginning of a regime change war. 
uh, if that were true, then it, is killing Qasem Soleimani a reasonable tactic to use if that's the way you want to start a war? I would say no. Uh, I would say it's not, um, it isn't strong enough. It isn't, it isn't muscular enough. It isn't shock and awe. All right? Uh, uh, it's actually too weak a signal. Uh, one reason it's too weak is that where did, the, where did the hit take place? On Iraqi soil, not Iranian soil. Right now there's a kind of threshold. Neither side is, is attacking the other's, the other's homeland, right? If you really want to put the Iranian regime back on its heels and send them a message, you attack Iran, not Iraq. Or you attack somebody in Iran, or something in Iran, not in Iraq. If you're going for regime change, if that's your aim, okay. Is that, is that, a, good, is that a good idea? Is that something that the United States ought to do? People have been arguing this for years, in my opinion. It's not a good thing to do. In my opinion, uh, not that uh, I'm philosopher king or anybody pays the slightest bit of attention to me, but in my opinion, uh, I would like this regime to be thrown into Trotsky's famous dust, dust basket of history, but I would like the Iranian people to do it, because every time the United States or any other country, any other, any other power, tries to do a favor to the Iranian people or any other people, it gets complicated. It would be much better if the Iranians themselves found a way to moderate, collapse, replace, substitute for, pick your verb, I don't care. Uh, how long will that take? Uh, it's already been 40 years the Iranian people have managed to put up with this regime. Uh, it, it's not, it's not um, anything to be proud about if you're an Iranian patriot. But anyway, it, I don't know how long it would take. But there are demonstrations in the street right now. There are anti-regime demonstrations. And those anti-regime demonstrations are partly a function of the pain that has been inflicted by the sanctions, American and secondary sanctions, European sanctions. Uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, that's just giving the Iranian people a little help, a little push, but it's not like sending the cavalry to do it for them, okay? So I don't like the idea, I mean, I, I, again, I'm very, I'm very fond of the idea of this regime being replaced. It's caused a lot of trouble, okay, in the region and beyond. It is murderous. And by the way, parenthetically, there's a, there was an argument in the, in the uh, stuff, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, material. Was, 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 was Qasem Soleimani evil enough to deserve to be assassinated, to be killed? I regard this as a non-question, okay? We are talking about coercive diplomacy. We are talking from a realist framework, right? Foreign policy is not uh, philanthropy or charity or a passion play. There are a lot of nasty guys out there in the world. We don't go and assassinate all of them, do we? All right? Uh, so I regard the question of whether uh, Qasem Soleimani was bad enough to deserve his fate to be a non-question. Some of you may disagree with me. That's your privilege. Get back into the, the flow. The, there's a third, I mean a fourth possible motive that you could connect this tactic to, and that of course is getting the Iranians back to the table to negotiate a better nuclear deal. Now we could talk about this until the end of Thursday here and miss, and miss, miss many meals. We're not going to do that, so I'm not going to talk at length about this. Just very te telegraphically, I was disappointed with the way the negotiations came out originally. I understood, however, the Obama administration's um, the situation that it was in, such that kicking the can down the road, they said no deal is better than a bad deal. What they really meant was any deal is better than no deal because the calendar was ticking and the politics were such that that's what the Obama administration did. I don't blame them. Being in their circumstance, I might have done the same thing. I was kind of disappointed when they took the Iranian enrichment um, uh, ban off the table fairly early on. I thought that was a mistake. That isn't important. Once the thing was signed, I thought it had its flaws. I didn't like the, the, the nearness of the sunshine, uh, uh, the sunset date. I didn't like the verification package. I thought the arguments made on its behalf were bullshit. But it was arguably better than nothing since the Iranians were less than 10 months away or 11 months away from a breakout. Okay? And that, meant, that means a war. So having, having um, uh, sealed this not great deal, was I therefore in favor of the Trump administration walking away from it? No, I was not. I was against that. Not because I loved the deal, but because of the P5. Because we walked into this arrangement with our allies. And the United States needs its allies. You can't persuade this president of that, but you can persuade most normal people of that. So if we walk into this with our allies and leaving the deal essentially disses our allies, which the president, of course, has done in many other ways as well, you know, undermining the credibility of Article 5 of the NATO Treaty and one could go on, um, this was why I was not in favor of leaving it, all right, even though I didn't like the deal to start with. And where are we now? Where are we now? Where, where, the, the administration has put itself by, by uh, leaving the deal and uh, attacking Iran, it's put itself more or less in the same position that we were in when the Obama administration had to negotiate against the deadline. So, he, so 
<coughs> so we're, we're no better off, except having bought maybe you know a couple a little bit of time. We're no better off than where we were. And it, it seems to me that if you if you get very personal with the target of the assassination, it, it makes it a little harder to get back to the table and talk with with Rouhani and Khamenei. I, how eager do you think they are to sit down at a table with the assassin of their friend? See, it, you personalize these things. Uh, you create externalities, to use an economics term, that, that, are, that are problematical. So could this have been, get back to the point, could this have been an attempt by the administration to drive the Iranians back to the table to get a deal? Well, you know, maybe. My, my view of it is that uh, this is, if, if this is what they were trying to do all along with the policy of maximum pressure, then where was the rest of the policy? Where was the offer to negotiate? Where was the back channel? Where was the setup, right? So to me, to use a baseball metaphor, you know, when you talk to Americans or hear Americans, you're going to get a baseball metaphor eventually, whether you like it or not. All right. So the metaphor, the proper metaphor here, the policy was all wind up and no pitch, no pitch. All right. <laughs> so so I'm thinking, since there's been no pitch for years now, uh, could this really have been the first to uh, a, a strategy to get back to the negotiating table and drive a better deal? I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. But that's the only rational. Th that's the only rational explanation aside from the, maybe the deterrence part. That's the only rational explanation for doing this kind of thing and doing it now. And again, if it were me, again, it's not me, if it were me, I, I don't think this is a strong enough message to get the Iranians back on, on, to the table on terms that um, would drive the kind of a deal that I think um, uh, the United States would ideally like to have. To have. Um, if the United States uh, had ordered, for example, the bombing of um, storage facilities and pumping uh, uh, facilities in Iranian's oil industry, if it had bombed uh, Bandar Abbas and sunk part of the Iranian Navy, uh, if it had taken out a couple of command and control nodes of the Al-Quds force, all of this without killing any civilians, if, ne if possible, I mean, that's shock and awe. That puts the Iranians back on their heels, and they're wondering, are they going to go after our throat? Is this a regime change thing? And, and then the message from us is, no, it's not necessarily a re regime change thing. Come to the table. Let's talk about it. Okay. That would get them to the table. Why do that? You know, wh wh why would you think about doing something <coughs> that violent? Why would, you, why would you take coercive diplomacy up to the next level? Two reasons. One is uh, to constrain the tit-for-tat period. The tit-for-tat period is a dangerous period. That's where inadvertent consequences and mistakes and accidents happen. And the second is, is that the Iranians have uh, situation dominance locally and at low levels of violence. It's their part of the world. Right? They know it. Uh, they're entrenched in it. They have infiltrated it. They understand it, right? We don't, all right? So if you really, really want to get them back to the table and you want to get a better deal and you want to do it soon, right before the election, if you're a, if you're a strategist, right? You've got, to, you've got to kick the escalation up fast to the point where American advantages outweigh Iranian advantages. Now, uh, if I were in the government and anybody had asked me, I would say, why don't you think about this? But of course, I'm not in the government and nobody asked me, and so you're all probably breathing a sigh of relief. One last comment. I, if, I, if there were a negotiation about an, uh, a, new, a, a better deal, uh, the reason that I, I, I would focus on, not everybody knows about the sunset provision, it's just the deal wasn't long enough right, to, to be meaningful, but, but when it comes to the, the verification package, at the time, a lot, a lot, a lot was, was made of the verification package, and it looks very tight on paper. The problem is it isn't. The problem is, is that every on-demand inspection, according to the, the document, requires the consensus of the P5. So that turns the Russians into Iran, Iran's lawyer. You remember how that worked out when the Russians were Saddam Hussein's lawyer? It didn't work out so hot. So it, to me, uh, those, verification, those verification provisions were, are, are empty. And I, you'd need to make them a lot stronger. Uh, but, but to your surprise, perhaps, unlike the advice that I, I've read from just about everybody, I would not try to rope into a new agreement a, uh, a limitation on, uh, on, on uh, missile testing out to greater greater uh, lengths. I would not try to make that part of an agreement. Here's why. As long as you can assure reasonably that there's not going to be a nuclear warhead that you can put on one of these missiles, I don't give a damn what its ranges are. The longer the range is, the more it makes every country that comes into range an objective ally of the United States. That's quite useful, or could be made quite useful if you understand how, how diplomacy works. So I don't, I don't want to do that. And the, and the argument that we should uh, also rope in, create an omnibus agreement, that includes Iranian mischief making, uh, intervening into the eternal affairs of Iraq and Lebanon and Yemen and so on. Make that part of an agreement, I think, is a very, very bad idea. 
Omnibus agreements are very difficult to put together, and they have a loose string. They're very easy to unravel if one side or the other wants to unravel it. So in my, in my view, a new um, nuclear deal should be as narrow and specific as we can make it and leave everything else aside for other modalities. You can, you can push back against Iranian regional behavior in all kinds of other ways. We don't need to write it down on a piece of paper. Last thing. I promise, last thing. I remember 1972. I remember the, the, uh, the winter of 1972. Uh, I was in college. Uh, I, was a, I was a senior in college. And most of you probably, some of you remember, but most of you won't. Uh, that was the time of the infamous Christmas bombings of North Vietnam. And that was at a time when the anti-war movement was still very much present on campus, and part of it was very radical still, and part of it wasn't. And the unanimous reaction of the, the, uh, the Ivy League campuses, including the one that I was on, was that this is horrifying. This is the beginning of World War III. Uh, the Nixon administration has gone insane, and we're all going to die uh, because these people are crazy and evil. Now, what actually happened? This was a standard exercise, a little bit telegenic, maybe, but this was a standard exercise in coercive diplomacy. And in less than a year, we had the Paris Accords. All right? Now, the Paris Accords didn't work out the way that um, the administration had hoped, but that had to do with political scandal, Watergate, and politics. The fact that the, uh, the Congress cut off all, um, uh, all, all money uh, to help protect South Vietnam from a North Vietnamese conventional invasion. So it didn't turn out the way it was intended. And that, by the way, that's, that's, that's a mark you should, you should remember. Uh, you can negotiate all you want. You can strategize all you want. You can analyze all you want. But if you think, if you think that scandal and politics and the happenstance that mixes all that together with international relations, if you think you can ever tease those things apart permanently, you're in the wrong business because you can't. And we again have scandal and we again have politics. And just as in 1972, 73, in that period, it's going to affect outcomes in international politics and in, and, and in foreign policy. It just always does. But the point is, is that it, uh, uh, the Christmas bombings did not touch off World War III. It did not incinerate the planet. It was not evil and crazy. It was just coercive diplomacy. And now the other sheet that I've, uh, that I've got here has been passed out. There are a couple of sweet little quotes. Uh, there are three, the, the, the top three say the same thing. One's from Henry Kissinger, one's from George Kennan, and one is from Thomas Friedman. Uh, and by the way, Thomas Friedman's two most recent articles are, I think, excellent. I don't always agree with Tom. He's an old friend. I don't always agree with him, but these last two articles in the New York Times you should read. Because what, what they try to do is lift up the level of analysis and say, what the hell are we doing in this region in the first place? What are these government, what, what is our government, what, is, what are these governments doing? Right? Uh, uh, so, uh, I hope you enjoy the quotes. The last quote, the one from Paul Keating. Uh, does everybody know who Paul Keating was? Yes. He was an Australian prime minister from God, a long time ago. I'll let you guess. I mean, Paul Keating obviously wasn't talking about any American president when he said that. But I'll let you guess who I think it refers to. <laughs> okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to present it from a uh, slightly different perspective. Uh, sort of trying to uh, take the Iranian perspective as it were. Um, I study Iran, I read Farsi, and so uh, I decided that to offset the dominant narrative, maybe we should look at it from that perspective. However, I do agree with Adam uh, here that uh, about the current administration, which uh, in my view suffers from delusions of adequacy, um, so, uh, I think my talk will be colored by my view of it to some extent, but I'll try to be as objective as possible. So, I'm going to start with the uh, U.S. Ju justifications and ex post facto rationalizations. Okay? The, uh, the first set is the proximate one of uh, the escalation by one of the Iraqi Shia militias that was trained by the IRGC over the course of several years, both in Iraq and in a uh, Iranian base in Khuzestan near the city of Desful. Remember, uh, when Saddam fell, several hundred thousand Iraqis returned from Iran, exile pro-Iranians, Badr Corps and other groups who had sided with Iran in this war. Okay? 
and they had been thoroughly trained by the Iranians um, to become proxy fighters and militias, just as they had contributed to training Hezbollah from the 1980s onwards. Now, this, I mean, this is self-explanatory. Um, the, the, the contractor was uh, uh, an American citizen of Iraqi uh, descent. Uh, I think he was from Michigan. And so the United States retaliated by striking Qatayb Hezbollah sites in Iraq and Syria. Then they tried to storm the U.S. Embassy. Uh, which, did, um, if you take into uh, consideration what happened in 1979 uh, and the host, uh, hostage crisis for 444 days, uh, whether you're a Trump supporter or uh, in the administration or not, this is a, a visceral thing for Americans. And of course, one can realize that Trump may have thought, oh, never mind Benghazi but Tehran 1979, 1980, okay? That sank the Carter administration. So there is that element to consider. Then, and this I find, you know, this comes from Pompeo and others and the, the, the falling all over themselves in Orwellian doublespeak and uh, so on to uh, talk about, oh, he was an imminent threat, but the notion that he was an imminent threat, but we don't know when, where, and how, reminds me of this ridiculous line from the movie Taken, uh, I'm going to come and get you. I don't know when, I don't know why, I don't know how, I don't know where. Uh, it's rubbish. He was not an imminent threat. Soleimani and his Quds force were responsible for si roughly 600 American deaths during the Iraq uh, occupation through their uh, sophisticated uh, approach to uh, IEDs. Most of that was given to Shia militias, not Sunni insurgents. Okay? They were fighting their separate wars against the US while murdering each other. All right? So, but since the US withdrawal in 2011 till the present, nine Americans have died in Iraq. I did a fact check on that and Soleimani was not directly responsible for them, okay? He would have killed thousands of people if he had continued his acts of terrorism. I mean, this, this is vague and doesn't make any sense to me. I think there was an element of revenge too. Soleimani has been targeted for the last two years, two or three years, maybe even longer, okay? He had killed or his units and the militias had been responsible for some of the most sophisticated IED roadside bombs. Now, I'm a realist, okay? Uh, it doesn't mean I'm immoral or am uh, amoral in this, but all this American tendency to uh, moralizing in IR, oh, we're a city on a hill, we're gonna liberate people and all, and the, the world is divided into binary uh, classifications, good versus bad, evil, doers, malign. Uh, it, this is bullshit, okay? This is justification for something that is not really a major, uh, yeah. uh, you know, many people in the Middle East ask me, why is America moralizing so much? Why don't you just talk about national security in a realistic fashion or tell us that you're bringing liberation at the point of a drone, okay? So Soleimani may have been a bad man. There are thousands of bad men around the world. And as Adam said, we don't go around bombing the crap out of them. Some are our bad men, like the Contras in Nicaragua, okay? Pinochet in Chile, state actor. So this idea is he's a malign figure, he's a bad man, he's an evildoer is not, not helpful, and it's not a real justification for it. He was not a terrorist. He was a member of a uh, state entity. This is a real slippery slope to go down to when you start designating officials 
of a foreign country to be terrorist. Just because the U.S. declared him a terrorist does not make him a terrorist. Any more than the, uh, the Iranian designation of the Pentagon and U.S. troops in Iraq and throughout the world to be terrorists does not make them terrorists. Okay? Killing non-state actors who do not come under the normal international legal uh, classifications uh, 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 of warfare has been done throughout the ages. But this has taken it to a new height that is a slippery slope towards a dark uh, um, sort of uh, policy approach. Okay? And I'm sure if the Iranians targeted an American general and killed him, the U.S. would claim it to be a terrorist act. Okay? There is an... And the United States complains about countries waging lawfare against it. But the U.S. is also capable of waging lawfare. There's got to be limits in the waging of lawfare and this kind of political warfare skullduggery that occurs between nation states. The major illicit activities of the court's force that is non-kinetic and the one that really puts them in a what I call a gray zone is money laundering, cooperation with criminal networks, and drug sales, which they use to finance some of their activities. And which is really ironic because when Soleimani was sent to eastern Iran after the Iran Iraq War, in charge of uh, Pasdaran units, that's the IRGC, was to fight <coughs> Afghan drug dealers. But somehow, the IRGC also morphed into a conduit for drug sales. They make a lot of their money that way. And again, as for the thousands killed in the Middle East, I'm sorry, I really doubt whether Donald Trump and his desiccated national security establishment care a lot about the killings of Middle Easterners. Iraqis, Iranians, or Syrians, okay, at the hands of Soleimani. I really don't believe it. So the underlying real reasons. Now, I agree with Adam's four uh, uh, plus, uh, reasons, um, and I'm not going to revisit them because I, uh, I think they are accurate, but let me look at some of the, what I call the deeper-seated ones, which link to some extent to his to his, but let me sort of look at it this way. The interplay between U.S. domestic politics, regional politics, national security in the Middle East. First, the, in, the incredible history of U.S.-Iranian animosity. This is remarkable. Both have a mutual animus towards one another that I don't think exists or even existed at the height of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet, uh, the Soviet Union, or even between the United States and North Korea. There are many reasons people can adduce why this is so. Um, some who like conspiracy theories argue it is a certain neoconservative, hawkish, pro-Israeli, pro-Gulf Arab, Christian, Zionist, evangelicals. Yes, they have an impact on that, but that's not all. There is a mutual animosity here, which for the Iranians stems from a history. Remember the issue of the Chinese century of humiliation? The, the Iranians have that conception. First of all, it was geriatric imperialist powers that have moved out of the region. Then it became America. Across the board, Iranians, whether they're monarchists or leftists or rightists, will always bring up the issue is, uh, the issue of Muhammad Mossadegh <coughs> and his overthrow in 1953 or 54, I don't remember. Then the support for the Shah and the training of Savak by the CIA and Mossad in which hundreds, and here let me quote Ali Muhammad Basharati who was uh, uh, deputy uh, foreign minister who said, I suffered torture in the Shah's jails, the torturers of Savak tore out my fingernails. 
and this was in an interview with an American journalist, he said, your country was responsible for that. Okay, this is uh, in the early 80s. Hundred, thousands of Iranians went through the uh, Shah's uh, jails and were tortured. For the Americans, the issue was the loss, and you know, Americans like to talk about loss of countries, loss of China, loss of this, the loss of Iran in 79, which were, along with Israel and Turkey were really the pivot of American uh, post-Nixon uh, doctrine policy in the Gulf. Then the hostage crisis, which as I said was a searing, visceral uh, issue for Americans. Then the failure of the mission to rescue the hostages and the images that were seen on TV as a result of that. On top of this, add what's known as Iran's bad behavior things, which include nuclear path towards nuclear weapons, malign activities in uh, the region, the network, the Shia networks, terrorist activities, um, and, um, and so on. Okay? Now, I'm, I'll address some of these in the context a little bit uh, later if I have time. The funny thing is, even as Iran has jettisoned its revolutionary rhetoric, it's not, it is suspended. You know, when you're a revolutionary state, you, you, you do things that piss off your neighbors. Every revolutionary state does that. Except for the United States after the, uh, which wasn't really a revolution, it was a war of national liberation rather than a uh, scotch polian kind of uh, social revolution. But all revolutions have a what's known as a demonstration effect beyond their borders. And if the country in question, which has gone a, uh, undergone a revolution, promotes revolutionary activity, it tends to cause a reaction. And that's what Iran did in 1979, 1980. Its subconventional political warfare capabilities were not very well developed at that time, but they still poked everybody else regionally. And that's why Iraq attacked them. Saddam was terrified of revolutionary Shiaism in his country. They uh, engaged in activities in Bahrain and so on. So, but right now, my view, and I think it's, uh, uh, in my view, uh, looking at uh, the evolution of Iranian national security and foreign policy, they're more motivated by national security and the context of geopolitics in the region. They're not trying to promote Islam. They're trying to pro uh, protect Shias from Su Sunni uh, extremism. They have a right, in my view, to promote their national security, like everybody else has that right in the region. So it's not only Iran who's engaged in uh, malign subconventional warfare activities, but the narrative basically puts them on a pedestal of evil. We could also say, wag the dog. So I don't want to revisit that here. But, and I think the context we need to understand here, is Sa Qasem Soleimani headed a strong, what's known as network of influence in the wider Middle East, which is the Quds Force, the Shia proxy militias that were developed or supported by Iran over the course of the last uh, decade and a half, or actually even longer. He was the, one of the key figures in developing it. His geopolitical acumen is actually greater than his military skill, even though he helped Bashar al-Assad defeat the, the Islamists and uh, I think, uh, was it Homs or Halab? and was responsible for helping the Iraqi military and the Iraqi PMF forces to reverse the tide of ISIS, uh, uh, ironically supported by Western Air Power and Special Forces. Okay? So he had military skill. What is really critical in my view is this was seen as a strike against Iran's regional wide network of influence. 
Okay? I think that was one of the primary reasons. Um, but, so who was Qasim Soleimani and why he was, was he so dangerous? He, even before his death, he was treated to the, what I call an Orientalist caricature of the man. The sinister minister, the shadow commander, the bad man, an evildoer. Yeah, all, all this is rubbish, okay? So let's look briefly who was this guy. Why is he put uh, up on this sort of pedestal as the most evil man since Osama bin Laden? All right? Well, he was born in poverty in the village of Rabod in Kerman province in eastern Iran, which is close to uh, Baluchistan and, Sistan, uh, and uh, Sistan. That will become relevant in uh, a moment. His parents were heavily indebted to the government, so he dropped out of school went to become a construction laborer in the city of Kerman to help pay off the family debt. 70, in 1975, he worked as a, because he was, you know, he dropped out of essentially primary, just before secondary, before junior high. So he was not really well uh, educated or anything. He worked as a laborer for the Kerman Water Board. Some people said, oh, you know, the sort of hagiography, he was a technician. He, he had no training in that. Okay? Now, Iran in 70, from 76 onwards was beginning to undergo the first signs of revolution. Okay? And so he claimed he got radicalized against the Shah's regime in 1976, which would make him about 1719, which, is not an, which would not be a lie. A lot, most of, uh, a lot of Iranians, high school kids and university students, mm -hmm began to get radicalized around that time, okay? Now, the revol uh, re revolution occurs and Soleimani joins the Kerman chapter or unit of the Sepah Pazdaran Engrelap, the IRGC, okay? 79, he was sent to fight Kurdish separatists in Mahabad uh, when uh, Iran was beginning to face separa uh, separatist um, <coughs> violence from uh, Baluchis, Kurds, and uh, Arabs in Khuzestan. He formed a bond with the IRGC personnel who were to become senior commanders like Mohsen Rizai. And he also established bonds with the Artesh, that is the Iranian regular army units that were sent to fight the Kurdish separatists, including uh, the person who became the head of the uh, Iranian ground forces until he was assassinated by the Mujahideen al khalq Colonel Sayyad Shirazi, who was related to um, the, the first person designated as successor to Khomeini, his name escapes me, um, was, was removed because of differences. Okay, Soleimani has incredible experience of warfare. Okay, from 1980 to 1988, he fought in almost all of the Iranian offensives against Iraq. And ultimately became a senior commander in the 41st uh, Tharallah division of the IRGC. When the war ended, he was sent back to Kerman to fight drug dealers coming in from Afghanistan with the refugees and so on. At that same time, and Soleimani was not known for speaking very often, but it was his first experience also of meeting Sunni extremism head on, which was beginning to raise its uh, ugly head in Afghanistan. Okay? He referred to it as takfirism. And, and that becomes relevant a little bit later on. 1977 to 1998, he became head of the Quds Force, the elite unit of the IRGC that's engaging in all kinds of political skullduggery as well as subconventional warfare. All right, let me just, got a few more minutes. His worldview and threat perceptions were shaped by three things. Okay. And this I got from 
reading his interviews in uh, Persian language, uh, also Iranian military magazines that I had, had the fortune of getting access to before they went behind a convoluted paywall. Um, now, his interviews are fascinating, and one of his most fascinating one <coughs> occurred actually in 2018, where he actually discusses at length what shaped him, the Iran-Iraq war. The Iran-Iraq war is the defining, experience, uh, the defining experience for most Iranian officials and officers, and the population at large. Okay? It is just like what would be a, uh, a visceral experience for Americans, is remembrance of the Civil War maybe, uh, the experience of World War II. This is the defining experience for Iranians. Okay? He was affected by the cost, the devastation, and actually the wasteful human wave attacks that occurred, which killed thousands of Basij volunteers and actually destroyed much of the IRGC cadre by 1988, the well-trained people. So they had to go back to the board and retrain a lot of people. Avoid such a conventional war again was a, a lesson for him. Second, the US military presence and its power in the region after 1991 scared him like it did many of the Iranian elite. And particularly the crushing defeat of Iraq in 1991 uh, the Iranian lesson for that, for, uh, the, the lesson for the Iranians, like for many other countries around the world, was do not fight the U.S. on its own terms. Okay? That was the lesson for a wide variety of nations, including some of uh, uh, countries that were neutral vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. Do not fight the United States on its own terms. The third issue was the rise of Sunni takfirism. Soleimani was actually ecumenical. He wasn't anti-Sunni, as some of the Iraqi Sunnis argue. Uh, not at all. He just thought that the Sunni extremist tendency to delegitimize Shia as Muslims and the genocidal murder of Shia in the Middle East, particularly Iraq, by Sunni extremists was something that he had to combat. That was a major aspect of his effort to form Shia proxy militia units to defend against this um, kind of activity, particularly IS. And finally, Iran faces a number of issues. The issue of nuclearization, the issue of conventional war, and subconventional war. Okay? Soleimani was not involved in so much in the first two. He was involved in the subconventional and political war. Because after the Iran Iraq War, and particularly after Desert Storm, the Iranians formed several, uh, uh, what do you call, lessons learned committees to figure out how to deal with national security threats. And Qasem Soleimani, along with Mohsen Rezaei and Admiral Shamkhani and others, were focused on what we call the political warfare and subconventional warfare <coughs> aspect in order to avoid escalation to conventional war. And then, of course, they uh, piously denied nuclearization. But frankly, I think, in light of what's happened, Iran is going to up its nuclear uh, uh, pathway, while also piously denying this is anti-Islamic, it's uh, illegal, and so on. But again, uh, what, what I find funny is those who are accusing it of nuclearization, what do you call people living in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Okay? So that's one aspect of it. So, Qasem Soleimani was heavily involved in what we call special operations missions during the Iran-Iraq war. He was a, a senior member of the Tharallah division, but he worked behind Iraqi lines. 
on numerous occasions, particularly in what we call the Karbala offensives of 87, 88. He began to argue for the expansion of the political warfare, subconventional warfare capabilities after the end of the Iran-Iraq war and also after Desert Storm. Okay. Now, he, the, the, two, the two aspects to this, what we call war at the level below conventionality. Political warfare. Iran developed political warfare capability, a hard element, which is subversion, bribery, uh, assassination aspects, and so on. Actually, no different from many other countries. If Iran is going to be, in my view, subject to moral sanctions for this, then let's talk about the special operations forces and assassination uh, uh, activities of other nations in the Middle East. So there is the political warfare aspect of it, which they refer to as Jang CRC, war, political war. Okay? <clears throat> Soft included attraction power of Iran via goods and ideology, which is largely limited to the Shia population, and information operations against Iran's major enemies, the US, Israel, IS, Islamic State, and what they refer to as the reactionary Arabs. Okay? Finally, they have what we call kinetic subconventional, or jang na, jang -e na monazam. Monazam means ordered or conventional. For them, this means not conventional warfare. In other words, at the level of, polit uh, of special operations forces and proxy forces. So we have it here. We don't have time to go through this. This is where they've been involved region-wide. Okay? Islamic State uh, um, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, first against the Taliban, whom they hated, now in favor of the Taliban in order to create problems for the US, Yemen from 2011, Syria from 2011. Okay, so what is his relevance? His geopolitical acumen, some could argue, was actually greater than his military skills. The ability to coordinate all of these forces. I think was a significant aspect. He managed to build up Shia militia and proxy networks throughout the region. He developed the ability to train, supply, and direct Shia militias to victory in coordination, not just with each other, but with regular forces, regular armies of Syria, Iraq, and Iranian regular special operations forces set to Syria from 2015 onwards. Initially, it was the, just the IRGC. Then the regular army sent special operations forces there. Helped Iraq turn the tide. Helped transform Hezbollah into the most potent non-state military actor around. In fact, they also learned from Hezbollah to, after 2006 when they sent a delegation of IRGC officers from their equivalent of TRADOC to learn lessons from what Hezbollah managed to do. So implications, and again, uh, I, f I agree with Ad uh, Adam to, uh, to a great extent here, but this is my last slide. Okay, we, you know, we cannot predict. I, I like to uh, quote Niels Bohr, the Danish scientist. Prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. Okay? Um, but this assassination created a wicked problem from those of you who work in organization theory and business. Uh, wicked problems has for, uh, second uh, order effects that are not necessarily going to rebound to one's favor. Greater regional instability with Iraq suffering the worst fallout? Possibly. A wedge between the Europeans and the US despite the, uh, the statements of some Europeans that you know the US had the right to self-defense and all of this. There was considerable dismay. Could Russia and China make greater headway in, in the region? They're already really sort of uh, moving in there in, in a uh, significant manner. Iranian nuclearization, I think, could be a significant factor. Okay? More, uh, Iran, let's put it 
non-moralistically or, oh, you know, Iran shouldn't have nuclear weapons because uh, they're crazy mullahs. It's not. There's one nuclear power in the Middle East that wants a monopoly. But nuclear power makes people listen to you. Iran suffered the disadvantage of not being a nuclear power in this latest confrontation. That's what they're also saying. They actually think there's a different treatment between towards them and towards North Korea. And the other thing is, which makes a, a, a mockery of some of the uh, claim that Iran's the greatest threat to uh, stability and everything. If Iran, were, if Iran was so strong, why has it really been not ineffective, but muted in its response to American escalation dominance. Iran is not as strong as is made out. You know, the notion that it's going to be a cakewalk, however, is not accurate either. It will cause more damage than Iraq ever did or Afghanistan ever did. So the, the statement, the Orwellian statement, we need to attack Iran because it's a threat. Some people will say, well, shouldn't we really establish deterrence for them? Because uh, if they're such a threat, they're really powerful. No, 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 they're weak. We can defeat them. So if they're weak, why attack them is my question to this. There is a lot of Orwellian doublespeak in the, uh, this thing about Iran being uh, a threat. Devastating war. Iran has actually said if a, any attack is launched on us, whether it is for regime, uh, uh, pressure to come to the table to abjectly surrender, essentially, uh, like the kind of attack you uh, talked about, we will consider this to be an all-out war. There's not going to be a half measure. If we are attacked within our borders, our inf infrastructure, our installations, and um, you know, command authority, national command authority, it is going to be a war, and we will retaliate against those who allowed this to happen. That's their, the way they've talked about it. There could be, on the other hand, a silver lining maybe, greater Iranian willingness to negotiate. The Iranian view is that we're not going to be dragged to the table to negotiate uh, away our right to sovereignty and legitimate self-defense. Uh, because one of the things is Iran can come back and we'll talk about ballistic missiles. Ballistic missiles are Iran's air force. If I were an Iranian official, I'd say, yeah, I'd be willing to trade them as long as all of the regional powers and the US there get rid of their F-35s, F-15s, F-16s. No. The country has not been allowed to have fifth generation fighters. So it's developed a ballistic missile capability. So their view is that you want to take away our deterrence so you can attack us easier or reduce our ability to defend ourselves. It, it, first of all, invade, occupy, and dictate terms of surrender as in World War II. We're not going to be dragged to the negotiating table to surrender abjectly. We'd rather fight. Any country will do that if it has the capability. Could there be an Iranian revolution? There's serious problems in Iran. Americans have a tendency to assume that because a lot of people hate the Islamic Republic, they're ipso facto pro-American. Um, I think we should disabuse ourselves of that uh, smug, self-satisfied, uh, moralistic approach. Uh, Iran, in the revolution of 79, had 35 million people. It's now almost 90 million. They want greater freedom. They don't want an authoritarian uh, government. They certainly don't want the Mujahideen al khalq The people who want Reza Pahlavi are the ones who live in what we refer to as Tehran Jalibs. Okay? Um, so when you see people saying Reza Pahlavi and so on, it is a protest against the Islamic Republic. It is not necessarily a pro-American or pro-monarchy or pro-Mujahideen. Iranians increasingly blame the United States for its policy of sanctions of uh, depriving Iran of its um, 
right to life, basically. So we, we need to be careful what we wish for. Obviously, me, I would prefer to see Iran becoming free of its own accord, okay, and not becoming a puppet or client state of uh, outside regional powers. And on that note, thank you.